So in this talk, I'll talk about work which generalizes SLP vectorization to allow you to pack or vectorize arbitrary independent instructions that may come from arbitrarily complex and different control flow regions. And before I talk about work, I'll first start with some uh, background on auto vectorization. So this is traditionally done with loop vectorization, where you take a loop and then it, you widen its scalar loop instructions into wider vector instructions. This may seem straightforward, but you can only do it if you can prove that the loop iterations are completely independent. And separate from loop vectorization, there's a later line of work called SLP vectorization. And with SLP or super road level parallelism, the idea is instead of directly vectorizing a loop, you try to vectorize a straight line code region, such as this basic block here. You first try to identify any code sequences that are independent and isomorphic, which are labeled in black and green here. And then you reorder those instructions so that the isomorphic ones are grouped together. And then you finish by packing those instructions into equivalent vector instructions. And compared to loop vectorization, SLP is both uh, simpler to implement because you don't need any complex loop analysis to rule out any loop carry dependencies. It's also more flexible because it works well even when the parallelism doesn't align perfectly along each loop iteration. So I'll explain the problem that we want to solve with our work today with an example. And in this example, we have two independent loops. They go over the same, ar same array, but searching for different keys within that array. And because in this example, the loops are independent, we therefore want to exploit that parallelism and vectorize them. So if you look at loop vectorization, it actually just doesn't work here fundamentally because the parallelism here actually spans amongst these two disjoint loops, but not within any of the individual loops. Uh, whereas if you look at SLP vectorization, although the parallelism here indeed fit, uh, fit the definition of SLP uh, super root level parallelism, because the instructions are both independent and isomorphic, uh, no existing S uh, SLP vectorization implementation is actually able to vectorize this code. And the problem here, and the problem that we want to solve with our work is, in order to exploit the underlying super root level parallelism, you first need to do some sort of co-motion so that you move these isomorphic instructions across different control flow boundaries. And doing this for general control flow requires very intrusive changes to a control flow graph. And more specifically for this example, so this is the control flow graph of this program. Suppose you want to pack the stores to that index array as well as the branches that lead to those stores. You need to restructure the control flow graph like this. And suppose you want to vectorize more to also include the loads that lead, uh, lead to those branches, you end up with a control flow graph that looks like this, which is now very different from the one that we started with. So first, it's not entirely clear how we directly derive the sequence of transformations to the control flow graph here. And secondly, this sort of transformations that we need to do here gets complicated very quickly when we also increase the nesting level as well as the complexity of our control flow. And the contribution of our work is we extended SLP, SLP vectorization to allow you to pack arbitrary instructions across uh, arbitrarily different control flow, so, so long as those instructions are independent. And the key idea of, of our work is instead of directly doing this transformation on a traditional IR that uses a control flow graph, which makes this kind of transformation very hard to get right, we instead use a alternative intermediate representation that tracks the control dependencies of individual instructions separately and explicitly with symbolic predicates that indicate whether those instructions should be executed. So I, I'll explain later with more details about how this IR works and how it simplifies our transformation. But before that, I'll first want to uh, give you a plan about how we want to use this IR. So before vectorization, we first convert the input program into this new representation that we call predicated SSA. And inside this representation, we still want to identify any instruction sequences that are both independent and isomorphic, just like before. And then we reorder those instructions so that they are grouped together in the program while still preserving all of the uh, program's data and control dependencies, which may require us to rewrite some of the predicates of these instructions. And after grouping the instructions together, we finally finish by packing them into equivalent vector instructions. So these are the three main stages of our work that I'll discuss in the rest of the talk. And first I'll start with some examples to explain how this uh, new IR that we call predicated SSA works. 
So suppose you have a left hand side C program, we'll just represent represent it with the right hand side instructions. So there are no more branches or basic blocks. There are just predicates, uh, which indicates uh, for each instruction whether we want to execute that instruction or skip over it entirely. So these things are still executed conditionally. And to represent any kind of forward control flow joints, we still use fee nodes just like before. But now the fee operands are now uh, labeled by the conditions under which uh, these values should be selected. And this is similar to a previous IR called gated SSA, if you're familiar with that. And to represent any kind of cyclic control flow, such as this uh, while loop on the left hand side here, we use a explicit loop construct shown on the right. And the loops like instructions also have predicates that tell us whether we want to execute or enter those loops or skip over the loops. And uh, inside the loop, there's a separate predicate that tells us whether we want to go to the next iteration or exit the loop. And finally, for this example, we have a loop that has a induction variable i. And in general, for any kind of values that are defined recursively, such as induction variable, we use a construct that we borrowed from uh, this previous uh, IR code gated SSA called mu nodes. And the mu nodes are basically like the fee nodes that are placed at loop headers in SSA. So they are characterized by both a initial value and a recursive definition. And this basically covers all of the features of our, our IR that I'll need to explain how our transformation works. And with that, I'll now explain how after identifying any isomorphic instruction sequences, how we actually reorder them so that they're grouped together while still preserving all of the program's uh, dependencies. And I'll explain how this works with a simplified version of the motivating example, where we have two loops with the first loop going over an array and searching for a value of zero, and then a second loop going over that same array but searching for a value of one. And in this example, because the loops have isomorphic instructions between them, we therefore want to pack those instructions into equivalent vector instructions across these disjoint loops. And doing this first uh, requires us to create a single loop that executes the bodies of these originally disjoint loops together. And to do that, we first identifying any uh, instruction sets between the loops and then sync them out of the loops. And after that, we can fuse the loops together. Now, for this example, because the loops have different trip counts at runtime, by just fusing them together naively like this, it's very likely that we'll be, we'll be skipping the execution of some instructions, even when they're required. And similarly, we'll also execute some instructions even when they shouldn't be executed. For example, they may have side effects. And the way we deal with this is by rewriting the predicates of these instructions so that they only execute uh, when they're supposed to. And for this, I'll need to introduce a couple of utility um, IR values that are called active flags for each loop. And the purpose of these flags is that they should return true if the original loops are still actively iterating and false if those loops have exited logically. And I'll explain later with more details about how we compute these flags. But assuming we're given these flags, we can then replace the continue predicate of this loop with a disjunction over uh, these flags. And this basically says that the loop should execute until both of the original loops are done. And similarly, we can also, repl we can also replace the predicates of these loop instructions by ending those predicates with the active flags. So now these instructions only execute when their original loops are actively iterating. And notice that we have these loop indices i and i2. Uh, they're defined inside this loop, but they also have users outside the loop. And originally when we execute these two loops in isolation, we have the first loop exit when i equals to seven, and the second one exits uh, with i2 being nine, and then these uh, indices are used outside the loop. But now because we are executing both of them inside the single loop, by the time both of them are done, we'll actually end up with i equals to nine outside the loop, which is not what we want here. So for this purpose, we also need to introduce a couple of more instructions to essentially preserve and remember the last valid instance of these loop indices. And in general, this is a transformation that we need to apply to any values that are uh, live across loop boundaries. And finally, here's how we compute these active flags. They're both computed recursively with a couple of mu nodes. Both of them uh, initialized to be true for this example, because both loops always execute their first iterations unconditionally. And for the recursive definition, we basically say any loops are only active in the next iteration if it's both curly, uh, currently active and also if the continuum predicate of the original loop would return true, so just by ending the active flag and the continuum predicate together.
And at this point, we have a single loop that probably executes the bodies of these originally disjoint loops together, even when they may have different trip counts at runtime. And what we do next is then recursively schedule any instructions or loops that are nested inside this one. And after that, all of the isomorphic instructions will be grouped together, and then we can finally finish by packing them into equivalent vector instructions. So for example, this pair of scalar loads just become single vector load, and this pair of scalar comparisons just become a single vector comparison, and so on and so forth. So I have purposely left out predicates of these vector instructions because it's something that I'll cover in more details when I explain how vector cogeneration works in general. So in many cases, this is straightforward. So suppose you have a pair of stores that shares the same predicate. We will just generate a single vector store that shares that uh, same predicate. But if you want to pack in, uh, stores together that have different predicates, we'll have to generate a single masked vector store instruction that has the true predicate for this example. And the true predicate means that this instruction will always execute unconditionally, but may have the side effects of it in its individual vector lanes disabled, uh, depending on the mask value at runtime. And here's how we pack the phenos together. We first line up their incoming values, and if the lined up predicates are identical, like in this example, we just turn them into, into a single vector phi instruction, which for this example selects the zero vector only if C is true. But if you want to pack phenos that have different predicates, once you line them up, we'll then have to generate a vector select instruction which individually for each vector lane sets, sets that lane to one or two uh, alternative value depending on the mask for that lane. And this basically covers the strategy that we use to pack arbitrary isomorphic instructions into equivalent vector instructions. And finally, I'll finish with some performance results. So on a paper, we ran multiple experiments on multiple benchmarks, but today I'll have time to talk about one of the experiments. And for this one, we ran our vectorizer or a set of purely sequential applications that were originally written by Intel intentionally with features that make them unsuitable for traditional auto vectorization. And the intention was be, because these benchmarks are so hard to vectorize, if you really want to use your vector units, you should instead rewrite those benchmarks in this new language called ISPC, uh, which is Intel's own data parallel probing model, which is not what we are using here. And what we're doing is, as a challenge, we ran our vectorizer over these purely sequential how to vectorize benchmarks. And before I show you the results, I want to first, first give you a code snippet to explain why these benchmarks are hard to vectorize. So this example is a volume renderer. It's a kind of graphics application. The whole benchmark is basically a five deep loop nest that's uh, first imperfectly nested and have multiple dynamic exits within the nested loops. But the parallelism only exists on the outermost level, so you can't even vectorize any of the inner loops or basic blocks. And here are the full set of benchmarks. They also have features that look like that previous uh, example. And if you run LVM's vectorizers, you can only vectorize six out of the seven benchmarks. And here we are including both LVM's loop and SLP vectorizers. And if you disable those two vectorizers and run a single implementation of our vectorizer, you can instead vectorize six out of the seven benchmarks. On average, we are more than 80% faster than LVM's two vectorizers combined. So, to conclude, we have a new framework that generalizes SLP vectorization to allow you to pack or vectorize arbitrary independent instructions that may come from different control flow regions. And this allows us to vectorize benchmarks that have very, very complex and irregular control flow. And with that, uh, thanks for your attention. Hey, this is uh, this is fantastic stuff. Um, Thank you. When you when you started showing the this restructuring that you're doing and the, the way you're handling the predication to merge things together, it occurred to me that, that this just looks like a really good loop fusion framework more than anything else. Uh, have you thought about using similar approaches in other settings where loop fusion might be effective? Yes, uh, this is future future work. Uh, something that we consider. So, for example, this IR also makes uh, fusion much uh, easier to implement and more robust. So for example, inside LVM, they do have a loop fusion algorithm, but they can't do anything if there's any instructions that between the loops because moving things out of the loops is very challenging, especially when you have control flow between the loops. But we can do that uh, trivially. So in, in, in the case where uh, you, know, you have two different uh, conditions for you know, the, the, I think the example was a store. Um, yeah. What what do you do in the in the case uh, where do you only ever 
uh, mask stores. So you always perform extra computation when you've merged two loops with different uh, conditions. Uh, and if if you only uh, like conditionalize the store, can't you uh, kind of like produce computation that might throw errors like division by zero or something like that? I sorry, I didn't follow the question. So sorry, sorry. Do you do you um do you only mask the stores or do you do like mask computation as well? Like if, if uh like in, in, in the case where you have C one and C two and let's say it was a, a computation instead of just zero, yeah. um how would you how would you vectorize the computation uh with different conditions? Okay, so uh so the general approach here is we, we don't just set a predicate to to be true, we set it to the strongest necessary condition. And secondly, uh, for most instructions that do not have side effects, this is sufficient because uh, even when you're comp uh, doing extra computation, it's harmless. And we, we do have special care when, when, for example, you're doing integer division. Actually, we just don't vectorize the integer division because they don't have instructions for that. Uh. Uh, just a very quick and simple question. This is very exciting work. Um, with IS the ISPC comparison, um, the graph didn't have the performance of the ISPC vectorized versions, yeah. did it? Are they in the paper? No, they're not on the paper. Uh, did, did you measure it? What's the punchline? Uh, we didn't measure them, but we compared them with the original numbers from their paper, and we are not doing as well as them. For uh, some of the benchmarks, uh, such as the volume renderer, we do match their numbers. And for others, so, so uh, the benchmarks we've written in their language is actually not a... Um, apples to apples comparison with the original ones. For example, they do have annotation, for example, to force the compiler to generate extra code to skip over. For example, if you have a mask that's purely zero, you just skip over those computation entirely. And uh, SPC have notations for that, and they're using that. And the other example is for one of the uh, benchmarks, such as the, the AO, uh, AO bench, they actually use a tiled version of the algorithm, so it uses the cache better. And they do that because ISPC does have a for each tile uh, notation to, to implement that. Got it. Thank you. Okay. If not, let's thank our speaker.